Hey guys, Comic Boom here with a very special guest, and uh, it is not Chase of the Comic Source, it is somebody who actually makes comic books, uh, my old friend and buddy uh, Tre uh, Trevor Fernandez-Linkevich, and it only took me how many years to learn that how to say your last name, Trevor. It's so good to have you on. Uh, those of you who'd, uh, who've who watched my channel, you know Trevor. He's uh, written Area 51, a Helix project. He's uh, uh, he's written uh, Minutes to Midnight. Uh, he's an in indie comic creator. And we're uh, I'm very privileged to be able to interview him uh, to talk about his new project, his first, his, his first jump into the superhero genre on a project called Rise uh trevor how is it going my friend it's great it's brother it's yes. I'm, I'm so glad to be here and and uh reconnect and get chatting about this book you know uh i think especially with somebody who i've had so much history with talking about superheroes uh it's kind of crazy <laughs> that now i'm coming up to bat to do my own well you know uh we were talking beforehand here and if it's you you, you were talking about you're talking about some of the uh the past arguments and debates you and I would get into, we would talk about the genre, we would talk about superheroes, we would talk about the motivations of Batman, we would talk about whether Watchmen is a masterpiece or it isn't, and all this other jazz. And and finally, I mean, I have to say, my friend, you are now, you, you get to put, you know, you, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And so you have challenged yourself with this. And even the name Rise, so are you going to rise to the occasion? I, I got to tell you, there's so many cliches I could, I could venture into right now. But uh, but first of all, I remember very specifically, I think it was back in April, I, I was uh, with you at Calgary, uh, Calgary Expo, and you, were, uh, you had mentioned briefly that y you had expressed some, uh, some trepidation or, or some maybe reluctance at that time to sort of, you know, venture into the superhero sphere at that time. So I'm curious, what changed your mind? What, what made you sort of decide, well, you know, because Area 51 was a... It was, you know, a good sci-fi comic, character-based. Minutes to Midnight was a, a series of different kinds of stories, not really in the superhero genre. What made you make this jump to the superhero genre? Uh, it's just it's that just the story the necessitated it, you know. Um, I, I had already, I had had a couple of superhero concepts banked in Google Docs for a while, um, and I didn't really think it, it would be anything I'd approach anytime soon, right? Like I've always kind of. Uh, decried the idea of doing an independent superhero book because I think more often than not it either comes off as fan fiction or a lesser version of what already exists because you don't have the legacy uh, or it's just brutal and contrarian and uh, it's just trying to be shocking and I didn't want to do any of those things um, I wanted to be able to write a superhero book that embraces the things that I love about superheroes that takes the tools of that genre that I think work the best and and focus and hone in on those without worrying about the um unnecessary set dressings and so i you know there, there there was something kind of earlier in the year that made me have to pivot in terms of my storytelling plans and i needed i needed a new concept and i started thinking about i don't know just coming up uh in this day and age as a young man and having the two and a half years of uh, the pandemic just excised my early 20s from me. Uh -huh. And I think to myself, you know, you, you grow up and, and you, you, you want to grow up and you want to be a good man. And you begin to question what that even means, right? Because we're told what it means by so many different people, by our fathers, by our mothers, by the institutions that we interact with throughout our lives. Um, and I thought about the ways in which masculinity is largely performative right it, it 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 requires a man to be something for someone else constantly and i think that's also why you have so many men in positions of power that are wildly fragile right because they they haven't built themselves internally they're like these hollow uh edifices to this idea of what they feel like a man should be and when i thought about telling that story especially in comics right like what is what is the way that I can best communicate that? What, you know, what is the ultimate pedestal of masculinity in comics? And it is literally the Superman. And so I, I, I felt like this was the only possible way that I could explore the story um, and, and 
that's kind of where that decision came from. You know, the story necessitated it. I think every decision I try to make, I let it be something that's spoken to on behalf of the, the story that I'm trying to tell. Well, uh, one of the things that stands out to me is, I mean, the topic is very timely because, you know, we got all kinds of social commentators on YouTube with, with PhDs behind their name uh, from from Indi from no names to big names talking about uh, sort of like there's a war on young men and there's a war on masculinity and there's a there's a crisis between the sexes and 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 there's a crisis of young men and women are more educated than men and men men seem to be lost and there's an opioid crisis and there seems to be a a, a loss you know there, there does seem to be you know like I'm 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 in my fifties I've I've I'm in a different generation and I feel genuinely like I've I'm I, I dodged a bullet by being born in <laughs> when I was because it, it really does seem like there's been this uh, uh, that there's a crisis that young men are going through. Now you're younger. Uh, I I don't know if I if if you'll reveal your age, but I know you're, you're in your mid twenties. And mm. I'm wondering, do you feel that? I mean, when you look at, is it exaggerated? You think that this war on men, that the, the the crisis that young men face in their social life and their work life, do do you feel that? And and uh, did any of that play a role in, in how you conceived uh, the, the lead character in Rise? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I think that, uh, and this, like, let it also be said that this isn't like my uh, artistic uh, uh, sort of, <clears throat> like, I'm not sitting here trying to justify why men do terrible things, right? Because men do do terrible things. <laughs> uh, but this is, yeah, this is me sort of wrestling with all of those things. Like you're, you're constantly being told that, you know, from a young age, whether it's from, from the generation before us, that we need to be like these warrior hunter gatherer providers who uh, take no slights from anybody and, and are willing to uh, fight, you know, over the littlest thing as a show of dominance. And now you sort of have generations of people who were sort of traumatized by that and now you have them sort of arguing the opposite like there there are sort of certain sects of people that also now expect men to be um subservient and docile and hypersensitive and like re realistically i don't think either one of those standards you know are attainable and i think what makes it even worse is that you're telling men how to be instead of just saying that Maybe as you grow up, you should be the man that you're comfortable looking at in the mirror when you shave in the morning. That's it, right? Like be yeah. a good man by your own standards, by your own principles. I mean, yes, it relies upon you growing up and maturing and, and, and having standards and principles, but be that person, right? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on what you just said here because I, you know, I'm, I'm on the Kickstarter for those watching on YouTube, uh, uh, I'm at the Kickstarter page here, and it says Rise. It's on Kickstarter. Uh, check it out. It's, and it says something very telling. It's related to what you just said, Trevor. Rise, a superhero drama and subversion of the hero's journey. And, you know, it's interesting. You say about, you know, why can't men just, we, we men, we got to learn to accept who we are and, you know, quit, you know, maybe judging us by impossible standards. And uh, because, because there is a crisis of young men, I believe there is. And yet I find it ironic that on the one hand, you just said part of the message is you got you, you can't judge yourself by superhuman standards in a way, and yet you're telling a superhero story. So I'm I'm curious, how do you reconcile that? And and in particular, when you say subversion of the hero's journey, it's a very interesting phrase, subversion of the hero's journey. Is that a subversion of expectations? So I'm curious as to how. Uh, I know you don't want to give away the story, but can you give some clues as to what what you're thinking in terms of that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So when you look at the um, the early stages of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, uh, there are this there's this idea that your character begins in the ordinary, uh, must be confronted by the strange, and then take make the decision to take a step out into the extraordinary. And um, you know, in my mind, I think that's kind of if every man follows the hero's journey, I feel like th there's a part of them that is um, lost. And that's what makes them hollow is that like you're always looking into the extraordinary as like this sort of superficial thing around you. And for me, this story is about this character already being willing to be um, extraordinary, uh, being excited to have these great abilities and the ability to affect change. 
but the fact of the matter is, is he's not as good as he could be because he's constantly sort of focused on, on the performative elements of his masculinity. And also like it, 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 it's how his powers work. Like this character, his ability to scale with the amount of free dopamine in his bloodstream. And biologically speaking, uh, there are certain habits that can get reinforced into, you know, a, a man's everyday behaviors, uh, based on the, the simple biology. And so for me, this story was about a, a sort of man, a hollow man who is extraordinary, who needs to kind of perform the hero's journey in the opposite fashion and take a step back down to the ordinary and ground himself in order to truly be great. And so that's kind of how we're playing with the hero's journey in so far as we are kind of doing it upside down um, in order to really focus in on this character's arc and, and becoming this great hero that he can be, but learning to do it his way and um, learning to sort of find himself in the process. Is this, uh, what's the plan? Is this a, a three, four, five, six issues? What's the plan in terms of the number of issues for the first arc? The plan for the first arc uh, are three oversized issues. So right now we're looking at somewhere between 100 and 120 pages when it's all said and done. So this first issue with behind the scenes features is 40 pages. Um, I don't know if they'll all be quite so large, but uh, yeah, we're, we're no less than 100 pages. It's looking like and probably not more than 120 um, unless I go nuts and then do like a quintuple page spread in the next book. And then I'm just filling up the book with crazy, uh, splashes, but so is, uh, is this actually an origin tale? Is this the, we, do we start or do we, uh, do we start with the beginning of the journey or is this, are, are, are we, do we start right off in, in the, with his powers already? Or is it really from the beginning page three, he's called to action and is kind of forced to um, make his superhero debut in a more abrupt way than he had hoped. Um, and so, yeah, it, we're, we don't really pick up with him in childhood or getting the powers, but it is his first outing as a hero. And um, it, it becomes very telling of, of the sort of journey that this character has to go on in order to rise up and, and be the best man, the best hero that he can possibly be. Well, Okay, now, there's a lot of projects on, on Kickstarter, okay? And I, I see this, it says Rise, it's a superhero story. And I look at, uh, and we got the images behind our heads here. The art looks fantastic. We're certainly gonna be talking about the art. I mean, uh, it lo looks amazing. The, the character looks amazing. He looks super heroic. But let's face it, when, when I see something like that, I'm thinking, well, he does look super heroic. I think of Superman, I think of Clark Kent. I see your phrase here. You're saying you're saying the right things to pique my interest, but boy, that could be. There's so many variations and directions that that can go. That means we have to go out and buy this. But I'm wondering if we get a little. I'm trying to get a little bit more out of you. So okay, I know what Clark Kent. I think a superhero. I think a Superman. I think a Clark Kent. I think of his moral compass. Mm -hmm. What is the moral compass of your main character? Uh, is it you, you said that you hinted that maybe he got his powers when he was younger, but is is his moral compass in the right direction? I'm, 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 is it, uh, can you give us some more hints there or not? Well, that's kind of, that's kind of a big part of this character's journey is developing that moral compass, you know, because he becomes a hero mm -hmm. because he feels the need to perform this duty given his abilities, right? It is a sort of great power, great responsibility scenario. But, um, I, I think in the beginning of the story, John doesn't, know why he's doing it beyond the fact that he's told that he should right and so he doesn't have anything quite yet that is intrinsically driving him to be that hero you know no particular no particular moral north star mm -hmm. and part of this story is him wrestling with the fact that he really um he doesn't have his own personal reasons for for doing these things and making these sacrifices and i think that that makes him that makes his entire quote unquote crusade quite frail. And so this, this story, a big part of it is him developing that. And part of, um, you know, a big part of this story is like sort of a man's relationship with intimacy and how that affects the ego and, and how that can shape a man and change a man, right? Like you're married, you have a daughter and I'm sure that the man you are now is quite different from the man you were before you had either of those things. Yeah. And so that is a, a, another major element. And, 
his quote unquote Lois Lane is a sort of take no shit, strong moral compass kind of character. And he's sort of morally fluid. Um, and, and so, yeah, he's, he's going to have to learn from her in many ways beyond just kind of trying to form this romantic relationship. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, but the, he doesn't, he doesn't quite have his moral compass established when we set out the gate with the story. And, you know, that, that makes, and that, that makes sense because I think, I, I think where I can relate to that, it, it, hearing you put it that way. It's sort of like when I when I started off as my job, you know, I didn't have a bloody I didn't have a clue what I wanted to be when I graduated high school. And 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 I found myself wandering into law, but almost because I felt directionless, but I was so afraid of not having a direction, I took a route because I didn't want I, I feared not having a direction more than anything. And I stuck with it. And then lo and, be, lo and behold, it became something that I was passionate about. And you almost stumble upon your, your, your passions. And, and, and when we talk earlier about young men not having a direction and feeling lost, you know, I, you know, I can see that being a journey that, that many, I think many young men can relate to that sometimes just sticking with something, just doing something, doing something, even if it involves just helping people or it, it, it puts you on a journey or a path that, you know, it rewards you and it leads you on to a direction that maybe you didn't know you were looking for. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, the art, I, I have to say the, the images here that are coming up in the background, absolutely spectacular. Tell me about, uh, the artistic collaborators you have here, because you, you, you certainly have a lot that you can talk about and show off here. Wow. Yeah, man. It's uh thank you. They're they're amazing. As always, uh I've got a global host of talent just really taking some solid ass kickery to this book. Um the A cover, which you're seeing on the screen right now, and the interior art uh is done by the incredible Ryan Best, who um did a short story with me in uh, Minutes to Midnight called The Bear, Bear Market Businessman. Um and he's he's an artist who is simultaneously able to capture the the bombast and the dynamicism of traditional superhero comics, but really focus in on the emotional character acting and expression. And that's something I've talked about a lot, right? Like even since the YouTube days of analyzing comics is how important to me having an artist who can make the characters act and express and convince me that inside of this page, there is a two dimensional world in which these characters exist and have their own wants and desires. And that comes through in the art. That has nothing to do with me. And so the great thing is having Ryan, who, who, who that is like one of his innate abilities. He's an incredible storyteller. He's an incredible character actor. And so he very much brings that to the story because, as I mentioned, like this is a superhero drama. It is about the man that it takes to be Superman and what kind of person you have to become, right, in order to fulfill that role. And so... More than anything, more than the bombast, more than the crazy triple page spreads with like gonzo uh, uh, compositions. This is about the people, you know. Um, so I'm super lucky to have him. Interior colors by the incredible Fabi Marquez, who is becoming uh, a rising star. She just got announced uh, to be taking over um, one of the, what is it called? Uh, it's like Vault's premiere book, Barbaric. She's coloring Barbaric now. She's colored nice. for the Power Rangers. She colored on Batman the World. She's just taking the world of comics literally by storm. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, and just like, she brings so much personality to her work. And that's like the type of stuff that you only see from generationally talented colorists. Mm -hmm. um, where you look at their art and you're like, oh, is this them? You know, like, because they don't have a, a brush stroke to play with. It's an energy. It's an atmosphere. And so I think when you are at the top of your game, those are sort of the, the, the imprints that you leave upon people. And she's very much one of those, just incredibly intuitive. Mm -hmm. Got Matthias Zanetti on letters, who, you know, I think one of the really formative things that um, stuck with me before I asked Matthias to work on this is we were talking in New York and he had talked about the letters, the letterer contributing to the visual identity of a story and that, that just echoed throughout my head and i'm just like this is the way that every letterer should be thinking because their role is so important and so undervalued but they are leaving the final stamp 
right on the book as it goes off to the printer. They are the last person of the creative team to really touch it and impact it in that in such a fashion. And and so, you know, he's bringing something really special to this as well. Uh, How did? And then, uh, uh, yeah. I'm just curious. So what, uh, I I know that you've uh, uh, over uh, the the many times that we've uh, socialized. You you said that sometimes it's it can be up and down in terms of collaborations with other creators. So in terms of collaboration with the artists on on Rise, mm -hmm. the, to what extent did their art influence your story, or was it something that they just seemed to be able to, you know, could they read your mind, or was it uh, was it did you find it difficult uh, or easy? Uh, how was it? Uh, how how was that collaborative process with the artists? Because you certainly sound like you're impressed with the art, but how was the actual collaboration in terms of the storytelling? Uh, your ability when when you told them the story. In terms of what they conveyed on the page, where did you ever find yourself influenced by their art, where the story maybe changed some tone and nuance, or how how did that work for you? Um, I, I think it it really just it allowed me to know that I could lean into the things that matter to me and not have to spend my bandwidth focusing on the basics. You know, like the the people on this project are excellent. And not in the like, oh, that's excellent. They are excellent at what they do. They are storytellers at heart. They know how what they do is going to contribute to the big picture. And that puts me in a spectacular position where we can really hone in on the little things that 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 add up together to make something go from good to great. And And that's what I really love about this group that I'm working with right now. You know, like when we announced the book at Baltimore Comic Con, um, I got to sit down with Ryan, the artist, and, you know, th this is a very sort of sensual, intimate dyna uh, book in, in that fashion. And we, we spent 30 to 40 minutes talking about how we want to render touch, like just visually how we are going to communicate the intimacy of touch. What, how are we, how are we creating shadows when a hand is depressing on a piece of skin? You know what I mean? Like, how do we push that forward? Um, and that I think is incredible that we can sit here and have 40 minute conversation about <laughs> how Ryan is going to like feather out hatching for when, you know, John uh, has his hand on Issa's leg or what have you. You know what I mean? Because that is a huge part of this book is that visual, physical connection and intimacy. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that like I think that we just have the perfect team on this book. And I don't always feel that way uh, about the things that I've worked on. I've worked with a lot of talented people, but there is really something special, I think, about the chemistry between the interior art, the colors, the letters, and and the story that we're building. So uh, it's, I mean, it's just a joy. It is honestly, I, I said this the other day in an interview, and I, <laughs> it, it's so rare when I look forward to giving art notes, like so yeah. beyond rare. And that is the case every single time I open my inbox and get rise pages. Well, it almost sounds like you almost don't, you almost don't have to, you can rely on their skill. You can just give them a general outline and they can just go with it. But I, uh, I further note that I can't help but notice when I go through your Kickstarter page, uh, that uh, you you've brought back the uh, lauded triple page thread. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm curious, is that, can, will we be lucky enough to get a triple page in, in all three of the issues, or is that just for the opener? Uh, I mean, <laughs> listen, if people show up for this book, I'll do it over and over again. I'm, it is it is an expensive uh, process, you know, because they have to they have to hand collate the books basically. And what's great is is because we unlocked uh, our first stretch goal at eight thousand dollars US, uh, we actually have two in this book, two in this one book, and you're looking at one of them right there. The inks too, at least. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. You know, it, if you guys show up for this book and you want more spreads, we will give you the spreads. <laughs> no, it, it looks it looks really good. Now I note is uh, uh, again the the Kickstarter. I uh, I've got uh, the link will be in the, in the in the show notes below. I I it's impossible. You've had. Tell us something about your various levels uh, of contribution, because you got. It looks like you have at least four covers: covers A through D, and 
Uh, yeah, D is the secret variant cover. And what are some of the some of the levels that you, you have? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that just want to get in on the ground floor, or maybe you know you just you have money to put toward holiday gifts. For five dollars, you get a forty-page comic for five bucks, and it's because Hello. we unlocked one of our backer goals, and so now all of the digital copies through this campaign are digital deluxe editions that are going to have cool behind-the-scenes content, interviews with the creative team, uh, sort of process. Uh, and craft based stuff where we get to kind of let you take a peek behind the curtain and um, look at how the sauce was made, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, and that's for five bucks, five goddamn dollars. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things I've prided myself most on is I feel like on the Kickstarter platform, I cannot find anybody else who delivers this level of quality product, physically speaking, in the print material for this little money. Um, because I want you to read this story. I care about the storytelling and I, to me, the money is just a means for me to continue telling stories. I, and so I, I, I got to tell you, man, I, that uh, I didn't, I was surprised you did that to be honest, uh, because, but I'm so glad you did because one of the things, uh, this has been the talk of, uh, many, a comic book YouTuber about the cost of comics. And, you know, the, the reality is, is the irony is that I'm actually willing to pay more as most of us are. I think. I'm willing to pay more for a Kickstarter comic because it's something different. Usually the quality is better, et cetera, et cetera, of which Area 51, Minutes to Midnight, and Rise of, I know Rise will be in another example of that. But five bucks uh, to get that, to get a genuinely fresh, different kind of story. That is, uh, I mean, now's the time to do it too. And, you know, any, again, I'm going to emphasize this. Anybody listening, guys, there's, there's really no excuse, man. Five bucks, you're going to get. I mean, now your average comic, God forbid you get a, you know, your variant cover is like five ninety nine to six ninety nine or more, or your foil cover. No, this is, uh, this is really, really great to see. And, but I think people should be getting the covers. I know as a fact, and I've, I've, I've got a whole slew of very 51 cover A's and B's. I know the quality that you put into the comic. I know you're passionate about it. And it's it's well worth it, and so uh, what are, some of the bundles here uh, talk about you know, there, there's uh, you can it looks like we have our choice you can just choose your individual covers or get them all as a bundle is is that what mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so we've got a couple different options um, physical printed books start at twelve bucks forty pages two triple page spreads a uh, hundred and five pound cover stock with eighty pound interior stock it is more wow. than two times thicker than what you're getting from the big two right now, more than two ice. Uh, and you're actually getting finished paper, by the way, you're not getting the, the newspaper print that you're starting to see from them again. This is actual laminated glossy finish. Um, you know, there are a lot of options. You can get the covers individually. You can also get all four covers for a modest discount. Uh, at the beginning of the campaign, we had early bird discounts, but those all sold out as they were designed to. Um, but I've also, for those of you that want to go digital and haven't really become privy to my catalog, you can get my entire digital catalog for $22. That is six issues of Area 51, the Helix Project, I think coming in at like 170 something pages, uh, 64 pages of Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death, which gives you four stories in there. And then a 40 page rise comic. So that's like what, 270 something pages yeah. worth of comics for $22. And a bunch of those books have some of that behind the scenes access into process and um, things of that nature. I think it's a, I think it's a steal, you know, uh, not even comiXology is competing with yeah. a price like this anymore. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. It is, and, and, and having <laughs> having read Area Fifty One, and um, uh, uh, and then your know, minutes to midnight, uh, this is uh, well worth it. And I, because I have to say, that there are some there are some Kickstarter campaigns that even from some big names that are very expensive, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and makes me sort of second guess and say, wow, that's a lot of money. But you know, hey, you get what you pay for, and uh, what. What I would just encourage people to do is that, you know, like you said, if you're not sure, buy the for 22 bucks American digital, buy it. Trevor's more than confident to stand by his product. Uh, I stand by it. It's it's well worth it. And 
Uh, man, it's a great. Well, I think as everyone's not on the big two, but screw the big two. I mean, it's such an exciting time on the indie market. Uh, I don't review it enough, obviously, and I bloody well should. That's why, you know, I'm glad you have you on this show. I want to ask you, you're right in the trenches. My God, you just came back from Europe, and we wanna, I want to ask you about that. Uh, yeah. how, exciting, how exciting is it? Talk about the trials and tribulations of the comic book circuit, comic book uh, expo circuit that you're on. You just got back from Europe. Uh, you know, tell us a story. Regale us with a story. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot. You know, it's... It can, it, it, it's like the best moments happen at comic cons when somebody comes up to your table and you get to, you get to connect with them as a real human being about something that you care about and that, that you poured straight from the soul, uh, onto the page. Um, but it's, it's a lot, you know, you're signing for eight plus hours a day, anywhere from two to four days. And, and, you know, you're, I mean, in my case, you know, I'll, I'll hop off a plane the next day. I'm doing th a show for three days in a row and then I'm back on a plane to go home and um, go go back to being a, a regular Joe, I suppose. But, you know, I've done like 12 of those this year. It's been a, a hell of a time traveling all throughout the U.S. and Canada and now the U.K. Um, I mean, in terms of general story. Ah, you know, actually, really, one of my sort of f favorite stories of this year was I was at the Memphis comic expo, uh, back at the end of September. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm, I'm signing books, whatever. Christopher priest walks by, looks at my stuff, <laughs> walks, stops, double takes, squints his eyes to look at me. And he goes, why aren't you over there with us? And I was just like, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have to make uh, you feel good. <laughs> but that that yeah, and then he proceeded to come and, and pick up some comics. But it's like that was that was a really big moral victory. Yeah. Um but you know, you get to have interactions like that. You get to, you know, interact with people that you admire as well. You know, like sometimes I still go to these things and uh I think about like some of the people I get to talk to and interact with, and they're people that I would have like sold, you know, my left foot to to chat with, you know, like I at Thought Bubble in the UK, uh, this past month, I got to go and, and chat with Ram V, who I think is, you know, one of the, the best working writers in comics right now. And, um, you know, I got to get a copy of Rare Flavor signed and be a fan for a minute again. And that's yes. also beautiful because you take some of it for granted. Like some of these people, I'm like, oh, I, I've seen you at six conventions this year. And, you know, you, you don't really think about um, sort of how important it is to still be a fan. Uh, and I'm glad I still get to do that on occasion when I'm not like ripping my hair out, trying to like optimize all of my packing <laughs> into suitcases and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's shoot, man. I, I, I mean, it, it's been a crazy ride just like going, meeting creators, having creators that I admire pick up my books. I mean, like I think like Jed McKay, who's absolutely tearing it up at Marvel right now has all of the Helix project, I'm pretty sure. You know what I mean? Like just knowing yeah. that those guys um, are 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 willing to kind of show show me that love and support, man. It it means a hell of a lot. And and then there's just the added element of like you meet readers who are are either brand new or they come back or like one of my favorite things ever. And you've seen it a couple of times with me in Calgary. Are the people who come in the first day, they'll buy like one or two issues, mm -hmm. and then I'll be like, okay, but I need you to read it tonight. That's like, just promise me you'll read it tonight before you come back to the show tomorrow. And they go, okay. They come back to me the next day. It's like, I need the rest. And that is always like, uh, it's, it's just like, I don't know. It just makes my soul happy, you know? Cause it's like, it's not somebody who was quite ready to like, to dive in, but they're, they're like dipping their toe yeah. in the water. And then it's just like, you know what? The toe dip is all they needed to get, to get kind that, of immersed in the material and that yeah, that's. You're right when you say that I've, I've witnessed that because, uh, well, it was, I guess, three Comic-Cons now. I've been uh, lucky enough to be with you as you've been uh, promoting your comics. And, and it, it always amazes me because I'm an, old, I'm an old collector. I've been collecting for like, God, I'm going to be hit with 45 years. So I don't know what it's like to read a comic for the first time. And it always amazes me, like straight up. It amazes me that there'll be somebody that'll come and talk ask you about your comic and you'll talk to them and you're going to, you're giving them your pitch. And it just amazes me. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm too bloody old and jaded 
because I I hear you know I I, I, hear, I hear pitches. Oh, it sounds cool. I'll get it. But it, it amazes me how so many will they'll be fascinated by. It. There's always a newbie at a comic con, and and for some reason I think that it's only old guys like me to go to comic cons. Of course that's not true. But how how passionate young people are that I see you communicate with. And you talk for, you'll talk for like a half an hour to one guy who's completely hanging on your every word. And it when I see that it brings hope to this industry that too many people at times are saying is dying and everything else. And you, you see that the hope really does lie in, in the indie market and that the passion is still there and the willingness is still there. And it's nice mm -hmm. to see that that's what your experiences are uh, when, uh, when you're out there promoting because, uh, I mean, I, man, like 12, I mean, you're basically once a month you're on the road, right? Once a month <laughs> yeah. on average. I mean, Some, I mean, you have a day life. job too. I mean, how do you make, you know, I mean, I mean, look, I know, I know that you, know, you, you, you got the dream in mind, but man, you, I know that you work your, your, your butt off, but oh my mm -hmm. God, man, but you're rising yeah. to the occasion. It's worth it, man. Honestly, like having those interactions with those people who are willing to give me 30 minutes to talk about things that don't exist, you know, like that's what you do it for. You know, there was like, there was a really defining moment like my first year doing the Memphis comic expo. So it was September of 2022 and um, getting to Memphis was like Jace coming to Connecticut to come do my first show with me and going home. Like it was awful <laughs> in terms of like everything that could go wrong would go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so basically what happened because of issues with, with mechanical delays in a plane and some weird fucking like crackhead in the the baggage claim area or the baggage check-in area of the airport i ended up staying up with like this old lady who was also supposed to be on this flight it's me my handler and um this woman and like i ended up staying up all night before <laughs> the show like mind you like we had we were originally supposed to fly out a friday night the show was saturday morning issues happened with the flight such that I, it was either I take a flight out the next morning and I basically end up getting there right as the show opens or I could, you know, fly to Chicago, but then the flight from Chicago to Memphis wouldn't take off until after that. So we ended up kind of couching there. Um, and I, there was like this moment of epiphany, like right before we boarded the plane or not even, I actually think it was on our connection in the morning where uh, I was just, I was looking at my guy and I'm like, I don't deserve to be tired. Like I, I get to go live the dream. I get to go, you know, <laughs> there's a point in time where I had to beg people to give me a try. I had to beg, right. I had to go online. Please just look at it. You know, like you, you don't even need to, you don't even, you don't need to go crazy. Just look at it, read it, open the page and let the, let the story do the talking. And now, you know, I, I get to go and interact with people who care about this thing that at one point only I cared about. Um, and that is like a privilege. It's it's the greatest privilege, uh, I think, pretty much of my life. And I think about like that moment during that connecting flight and like that sleep deprived like epiphany. And I think to me, like that was just like such a defining moment for my career where, you know, I go through these phases where, you know, cause it's a lot, like you said, I'm, I'm traveling a lot. I still work a full-time job. I'm creating, planning for the future, you know, always a bunch of spinning plates. And then it's like, when I feel like I am most drained, I think back to that moment. Um, and like, there's something about it that always rings true. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you won me over, but of course I'm a sure thing. So, uh, <laughs> but I, it, I encourage everybody to check this out I'm, again for five, even if you, if you buy the digital, uh, I've not read it yet. Obviously, uh, if it is, I'm a sucker. I, I'm one of the guys that ruins things and spoils things. I probably have spoiled it. It's a good thing I didn't read it. And, uh, but, uh, for five bucks, I, I mean, come on. I mean, this 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 is a no brainer to me, and uh, I'm I'm gonna make a prediction that anyone who gives out five bucks digital is gonna want to buy a physical copy as well. So, final thoughts, uh, Trevor. Uh, if you want to give uh, you want to give a, a final final pitch for uh, for Rise. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Rise is is my attempt to really 
explore masculinity through the image of the perfect man. You know, we are, we're examining sort of a, or we're going on this journey of the pursuit of power and pleasure and, and to some degree self-control. Um, and it's about learning to kind of ground yourself in order to lift the world up on your shoulders. Right. Um, and, and being able to find your reasons for doing it. No one else's, they have to be yours. They have to come from the soul, not because, you know, uncle Ben was dying right in front of you and told you, you needed to do it. Um, and, and that's what this story is about. You know, we're, we're sort of asking these big questions, you know, what would happen if the strongest man on the planet had to feel good to do good? What does it take to rise from man to Superman? Uh, how has masculinity become defined by performance? And what does that mean for a man who is responsible for the lives of billions? Um, hopefully we will answer all of those questions in a very satisfying way. Um, but we're, we're daring to explore these really sort of touchy topics. Um, and, and I think ultimately just tell a story about a man who needs to find himself in order to really be strong. Right. Um, and I, I think that is something that you don't really get to see in this genre. I think that the way that we are playing within the superhero space is going to remind you why you love superheroes in a way that only we can. And it's that we love it because it, underneath it all, there are people, there are characters with real wants and desires who have real urges and, and downfalls and pleasures and pains. Um, and that's what we're, we're focusing on. We are using the, the bombast and the, the excitement of the crazy triple page spreads and the feats of strength and heroism to tell a story about people. And so, you know, I think, I think we, we really are kind of treading a path to do something different in a genre that has now defined an entire generation of entertainment, if not more, right. And beyond. So, um, I hope you all give it a look. You know, I, I promise you, I would not be touching this genre if I didn't <laughs> think we could add to it. I, I hate redundancy. Um, but I, I think we've made a story that matters and it's not trying to tell you how to think it's just kind of exploring the possibilities, you know, of, of these, these sort of really emotional topics. So I hope you guys give it a look, uh, pretty cost effective. We've also got some really, really great tiers, uh, on the higher end of the spectrum getting drawn in, which I think is amazing to be immortalized. You can become a, a producer of the series officially. Uh, and then if you, are so inclined we do have one page of original interior art left on the campaign so uh not only do you get all four covers with that you get signatures from both myself and the artist but you get an 11 by 17 original art page of uh inked bristol board so yeah you know i don't i don't think many people are offering that i've never gotten to offer that before one of them is already gone there's only one left so uh, yeah. I think that's a great, a great, uh, maybe late holiday gift to the big comic book art fan. Um, but yeah, aside from that, I, I hope you guys give it a look. Yeah. And I certainly encourage people to, I'll, I'll leave the link below. Uh, we've been, the, the Kickstarter page has been behind us as, uh, as we've been talking and man, I, I just want to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you. I, I live vicariously through you. I'm one of those guys. I'm one of the dreamers that uh, always thought of uh, making their own comic. But you're you're living the dream while I'm just watching it happen. But uh, I'm I'm enjoying the view, my friend. Uh, you you got to actually live it. <laughs> and uh, you've had uh, uh, not to be dramatic, but I know that you're on your own kind of hero's journey, at least in my mind. And it, it, mm. it really is good to see. So I can't wait till you inevitably get to that reward. And uh, fingers crossed. And so yeah, it's uh, I'm really happy for you. So thank you. Man. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. And and yeah, for those of you watching as of recording the video, we have two days left. Not too sure like when this goes up, but um, it does end the evening of December 4th, which is also the artist's birthday. So do Ryan a solid buy his book. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, that was not planned at all, by the way. Um, oh. But yeah, so the, the campaign will end soon. Get in on it. We are so close to making this my second Kickstarter to break $10,000 American. We're uh, right now with within five hundred dollars, and oh, so uh, I, I would really love to do it. Prove a point that books can.
can succeed on the quality of the work and not on anything uh, but that, right? And the spirit of the people behind it. There are no gimmicks. It's all passion. It's all love for the medium and for the craft and for the people who read those stories. Um, so I hope you'll help us get there. Any any big sort of milestones, you get free upgrades. That's how we have two triple page spreads because of up, because of uh, you know the, the support and breaking these milestones. We've got uh, free stickers coming out to physical backers as well. We have a chance to bring more if we I think if we cross if we somehow manage to have a miracle and cross twelve and a half thousand. Uh, everybody who has the Ivan Tau secret variant will automatically get upgraded to a foil cover. So, you know, we, we do our best to give back when you give to us. And, uh, you know, uh, I just, I thank anybody who's watched it, watched this, uh, interview, made it this far. Let me babble about, uh, these weird things and people that, that don't actually exist, but, uh, somehow matter. So, yeah. um, I'm grateful, man. Thank you for having me. You bet. Good to have you. And this is going up right away. And let's, uh, let's get to 10,000 American, my friend. Look, I, you know, I'll, 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 I will, I've managed to avoid drinking too much alcohol for my New Year's resolution this year, but I will drink with you when that happens. <laughs> Beautiful. I, you know what? I will hold you to it. We'll, we'll hop right. on an old school call and, and have a drink. All right. And with that, I shall say goodbye to my friend Trevor and encourage everyone to contribute to Rise. And until next time, Comic Boom out.